Hey everybody, it's Derek Colmartin from CodeOpinion.com. Consistency is incredibly important when you're working with an event-driven architecture. You need to ensure when you make a state change that the relevant events that you need to publish are actually published. This is because events are first class and they're what driving workflows and business processes. You need consistency between your state changes and publishing events. I'm gonna show two simple lines of code that better illustrate this problem and the various ways that you can solve it. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So I'm looking at the eShop on web sample application, and I made just a minor change to it to illustrate the problem. So I'm looking at the order service and then the create order async method here. And these two last lines are what cause all the problems. So what we're doing is we're creating a new instance of our order, and then we're publishing an order placed event with the order ID to our message broker. And then after that, this last line here is we're then persisting and saving that order to our database. But why do these two lines cause all kinds of problems with consistency? So the first issue we had with those two lines of code was actually a race condition. And that's because we're publishing the event before we actually persisted it to the database. So that first line was actually publishing it to our message broker, the order placed event, but we could have a consumer. Let's say our consumer is within our logical boundary that needs to send out the email confirmation of our order. It may pick up that event immediately from our broker to send that email. And when doing so, it may have to reach out to the database to get that order information to include it in the email. But the problem is we haven't persisted it yet. We published the event, but we haven't persisted it. So our consumer reaches out to that database for that particular order that is in our message, but it's not there. It's not till that second line actually occurs that we're actually persisting the data to our database. So we have a race condition. Now the second issue beyond the race condition is having them in this order of publishing our event and then persisting is what happens if for whatever reason, this fails. Persisting to our database fails. This could be a magnitude of reasons why this could happen. Maybe there's some constraints that we have, the database connection. There's a pile of reasons why this could actually occur. But the problem here is that we've published an event stating that something has happened, that an order was placed. And we have downstream services that are expecting that, yes, there was an order placed, but there wasn't. So we're really misleading about kind of the order here. We want to persist. We want to make our state change before we publish an event. So like many things, this is just a general rule to persist state before you publish an event. But that's not always the case. There's something like the listen to yourself pattern that doesn't really follow this, where you're actually publishing an event first. And while the listen to yourself pattern does actually solve this consistency issue that I'm describing in this video, I need to cover it on its own as it has a lot of downsides and trade-offs that you need to be aware of. So make sure to subscribe as I'll have a video about that soon. So back to the code, if we need to remove that race condition, it's really just a matter of kind of switching things around so that we're saving state to our database before we're publishing the event. But here's now the problem, is what happens if we actually successfully persist state to our database, but we fail to publish our event to our message broker? Again, there's a bunch of reasons that this could happen. Our connection to the message broker, the message broker is unavailable. There's different reasons why this could happen, and now we're in a really bad place because we're not gonna be consistent about our state and publishing an event. Meaning we've successfully placed an order, but no downstream services that are aware of this, a part of workflow, none of that's gonna get kicked off because they're completely unaware that an order was placed. Now, one of the solutions to this problem is really about availability. So that means that we have to have some kind of resilience and fallback in case we can't publish our message to the broker. Now in the video that I did with McDonald's and their EDA process, this is actually what they do, they have a fallback. So this means that when our producer is trying to produce our message, but it can't connect or publish our message to our broker, there's some type of failure there. What we do is that we then push that message to durable storage. In the McDonald's example, they were using DynamoDB. So they're publishing that message or persisting that message to DynamoDB, serializing that message. And then they had a retry mechanism which was an AWS Lambda that then fetched that out of the durable storage, DynamoDB, and then it was the one that was trying to process and send this message to the broker. Jumping back to some code, what I'm illustrating here, and I'll kind of run through it, is kind of a retry and fallback. 
When I did the video about Wix.com and their kind of EDA pitfalls, this is actually what they did as well, is they were actually serializing the message and persisting it to AWS S3 and blob storage. So what you could be doing is I'm generating, I've persisted my data to our database, I've saved our order, I have our order placed event, and what I'm using here in .NET is just the library called Poly, and I'm building a retry policy, I'm, uh, I have a fallback policy that's gonna persist and put that um, object or serialized event in S3, and then I'm executing it. So I have a retry policy with kind of some back off, a one second, two seconds, and three seconds. And after all of that fails, then we're gonna hit our fallback and just save that uh, event to S3. Then again, like Lambda, uh, in the case that I was describing earlier, you'd have some mechanism that's looking at S3 to then deserialize those events and try to publish them to your message broker. So what are the downsides to having this fallback as a solution? Well, you still really don't have any guarantee 100% because your broker that you're trying to publish to could be down and you may not be able to actually persist to your fallback or durable storage or whatever you're doing there. So what's the likelihood of that happening? I can't really say that's really dependent on your environment and kind of the risk involved in that. So that's really up to you. It may work, it may not work. Uh, lastly, it's just publishing messages and how they're gonna be potentially out of order. You could be publishing some messages to the broker successfully, but maybe there's transient errors. So those are going to durable storage in your fallback and whatever retry mechanism is happening to pull those from durable storage and publish them, things could kind of get out of order there. Now that's not to say that should be a problem, but if you're expecting to process messages in order, it could be a problem. So another solution is to use the outbox pattern. And I've mentioned this in other videos where what happens here is that you're saving your state and your event within the same atomic operation, same transaction in your database. So in my example of when we were creating our order, that means that we're saving the data of our order in our database, but we're not gonna go publish that event right away, but rather what we're gonna do is we're gonna serialize that event and persist it within the same transaction in a specific, say, table or collection in our database, and let's serialize it, for example. That's where we're saving it. That's all gonna be consistent within our database. Then from there, what we're gonna have is a scheduler, some publisher, that's then gonna be looking at our database for those events that we've persisted there, pull those out, and it's gonna be the one then publishing those to our message broker. Once that's successful and we published our message, we then need to reach back out to our database to either remove that record or update that record to indicate that we've actually published it. So what are the downsides to the outbox pattern? Well, the primary one that everybody mentions in comments anytime I mentioned it, is really just the performance impacts and the load that you're adding to your primary database because you're adding, inserting these records. You have to update or delete them to confirm that they're actually processed correctly. And that schedule publisher then potentially has to fetch those out as well. So there's just a bunch of different operations that have to happen on your primary database, which means that you're gonna increase load on your primary database. Now, will that matter, that additional load that you're adding to your database? I don't know, that's completely dependent on your context and how many events you're publishing, the type of database you're using, et cetera. So is it that performance impact gonna be significant to you? It all depends on your context. Now my suggestion, if you wanna use the outbox pattern, is don't implement it yourself. One option is to use a messaging library that supports it and probably supports many different patterns and concepts that you're gonna need with an event-driven architecture. So look at a messaging library. If your database supports it, you can also look at a CDC tool, Change Data Capture, Wix.com, the video that I covered with them, they were using Debezium to pull out from the bin log of MySQL and then publish that to, I believe, Kafka. And that the benefit of that, of using that CDC tool for that outbox, is it actually doesn't have that performance implications that I mentioned. One last solution I wanna mention are platforms that support workflows and guarantees of execution of workflows. So I've been looking more and more into this, specifically with Temporal, where it has the idea of acti activities within a workflow that are guaranteed to execute. So that means in the case of our order processing, that means that we may have one activity that is actually creating the order and persisting that to our database. And then once that's executed, Temporal will then execute our publish event activity. And for example, that may fail. There may be some type of failure there, but because underlying we're dealing with queues and messages, we can have retry mechanism that then try to execute this again. And maybe there was just some transient issue where we then were able to publish uh, that event, 
But because we're kind of doing workflows, maybe that event was for external systems. And then internally, because we were sending that email, we're not really relying on that event, but we're just using activities and workflows so that we can execute that send email. So another thing to look at is kind of durable workflows and these types of platforms and frameworks that allow you to execute um, activities or parts of a workflow and guarantee their execution. So hopefully this video gave you some ideas about how you can reliably publish events. When you're in an event driven architecture, it's critical that you're consistent about the state changes and publishing the events about those state changes. There's other downstream services and processes that are expecting these events to occur so they can continue different workflows and business processes. If you have questions about topics like this, where you'd like to ask other software developers about software architecture and design, make sure to join my channel where you can get access to a private Discord server. Check the links in the description on how to join. If you thought this video was helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.